Unfortunately, most parents failed to have their own needs taken care of in childhood, and they often didn't learn appropriate individuation from their parents. Therefore, they will do a much poorer job than our ideal parents. The parent's lack of individuation is then transferred to the child. This lack of individuation, like all problems, is best viewed on a continuum. Parents are often either too enmeshing or too abandoning. Enmeshment is a feeling of being smothered and engulfed with love, which is hardly true love at all. Imagine what it would feel like if somebody held on too tightly, squeezed too tightly, or kissed a person who did not want to be kissed. It makes that person want to push away as hard as quickly as they possibly can. That is a healthy response. The person who is hugging is not showing love in an appropriate way. They are being too smothering. The difficulty for a child or a toddler is if they push away mom or dad, they believe that they reject mom or dad's love and that is viewed as a horrible thing. Kids tend to assume that parents know what they're doing which is a pretty dangerous assumption. So a child will often accept the inappropriate hugging and they'll learn several things by that. They will learn that they are not valued, that they shouldn't have boundaries, and that the other person is more important than they are. The most important and dangerous result is they'll learn that love means being swallowed up, being consumed, and not having any boundaries at all. If parents want to be too loving, if they want to be your friend too much, if they are needy, if they guilt trip or shame trip a, a child for not responding in the particular way that they want the child to respond, the child will feel enmeshed. If the parents are severely mentally ill, depressed, or if they come from a different country and simply don't know the language and the child eventually becomes their translator, the child could well feel smothered and learn that love is too needy. This can cause a fear of intimacy and a fear of getting close. On the opposite end of the continuum is abandonment. Abandonment is about feeling left behind not valued and unloved. Imagine that I'm a pilot and I take a person up in a small plane around 10,000 feet. We're having a good time, but all of a sudden I decide, you know, life really isn't all that enjoyable anymore. And I decide I want to commit suicide. And I let the pas passenger know that. I get up and go sit in the back seat. If the other person doesn't know how to fly, they're going to be absolutely panicked they're going to experience once again the fear of death, of dying, and the knowledge that they can't make it alone. They're going to be humiliated by the experience and never forget it. They're going to promise me anything. They're going to tell me what a wonderful person I am so that I get back in that seat and bring the plane down to safety. Now when we land, they're going to turn on me and I'm going to be in deep trouble. Not only are they never going to fly with me again, but they also might never fly, period. Abandonment fears can develop and generalize from any significant early loss or abuse. If one grew up with parents who were alcoholic or drug addicted or were divorced extremely early, or who went off to war during a very critical developmental period of a person's life. Abandonment fears could have developed. If a person grew up with very traditional parents based on the 1950s model where the father didn't talk about his feelings much and often the mother didn't either, the child will feel a sense of abandonment. If the child feels abandonment, they will internalize that rejection and decide that it must be their fault. Shame results from any perceived abandonment. 
There will also be shame if a child is smothered, as if they're not perceived as important and real in their own right. There will be shame from being left as a child, either physically or emotionally, as if the child were not important. Very often, parents act both abandoning and enmeshing, which is really confusing for the child. A number of years ago, I worked with two teenage girls, 15 and 16. They came into the office separately, but during the same week. They were both pregnant, and they both wanted to have the child. I asked them if they knew the father, and they said yes, but they didn't want the father involved. When I asked why not, they replied, I just want to have the child myself. When I asked why, they told me that they wanted to make sure they always had at least somebody who would love them. And that was chilling. That isn't even a good enough reason to own a pet. A person should get a pet because they want to show love to them, not that they want to get love from them. Those little girls were asking to be taken care of, and the tendency is that their children are going to feel enmeshed and abandoned by them. On some level, they will know that this is not real love. When that realization occurs, it creates a very deep hole in the soul where the parenting should have been. That causes the child to become only partially individuated. In some ways, they will grow and become mature. And in other ways, they will still be very childlike and very needy. If a person has been brought up in this fashion, and my contention is that most people have, when they turn 18, they have a hole in their soul. They feel like half of a person, and what they want is to find their one true soulmate in order to obtain the other half. The difficulty, of course, is that if each individual is only half of a person, and they are trying to get a half from this other half of a person, then each person is going to become diminished, which leaves each person with only a quarter. What is amazing about these kinds of relationships is that they are viewed as completely normal. What each person is looking for, of course, is their one true soulmate. And our culture says, that's right, everyone is destined to find their soulmate. In reality, there are many people who we could have very loving and very happy relationships with. There are no just one soulmates, only great partners. We are whole and not halves. The reality is that out of the billions of people in our world, the chances of a person finding their one true soulmate is ludicrous. The belief is that once that partner is found, everything is going to be perfect. The goal is then to merge gloriously and become one. That isn't love. That's self-love. It's possessive love, immature love, only romantic love, and that's what our culture normalizes. If you look at the movies and listen to the music, what you hear is you are my everything and I'll die without you. In fact, you're my better half. We don't even get to be our own better half because the other person somehow is better than we are. It is absolutely crazy. It is self-defeating and that is why our divorce rate is up to 50% because the individuation and maturity isn't there to establish a good relationship. When two people who have not fully individuated come together, they experience for the first time in their lives the feeling of being whole. What the man is asking for, of course, is a full independent woman of the new millennium to be strong and a partner. But at the same time, when he feels sick, for mommy to rub his forehead. What the woman wants is a strong, independent male to share her life with, but she'd also like to be taken care of as well. 
The difficulty occurs when these contradictory roles begin to blur, and it comes down to deciphering when one is asking for a full, independent, and loving partner, and when they are asking to really be parented. In an attempt to get the old childhood needs to be finally met, at least partially, the couple begins to metaphorically engage in incest, and eventually they feel it on a very vague level. It's not something that people really know consciously, but they often call each other mommy or daddy. Eventually, one of these people blinks and begins to distance themselves from the relationship, either physically or emotionally. That person is often the one who has been most enmeshed in their childhood. They've been too smothered, and they are either highly sensitive to inappropriate attempts to get close, or they view appropriate attempts to get close still as enmeshment, and so gradually move away from intimacy. They begin to read the paper more, or they stay at work longer, and don't really focus on the other person. They stop viewing their partner in the I-thou way. The other partner, of course, feels abandoned and begins to act like the pursuer. She tends to relive that abandonment feeling, which means that in some ways, she actually goes back to one and a half years old and re-experiences the abandonment all over again. Since infant time is much longer than adult time, the pursuer feels as if a minute is an hour, and they often even have physical symptoms of withdrawal for the other person. They feel desperate to get that person back, so naturally they pursue and when they do, the distancer is going to feel enmeshed once again, and they are going to run. Usually, I describe this addictive dance with the female in the role of pursuer and the male as the distancer, because in my clinical experience, it has been about 65 to 75 percent of the time in those positions. It also happens the other way, however. The male can be in the pursuer's position, and the woman can be in the distance position. And they both can share those roles. But I'm going to use the stereotype for this particular discussion. So again, what happens is that the distancer backs away. The pursuer feels abandoned, comes towards the man, and asks, why aren't you spending more time with me, and why aren't you treating me better? Why aren't you showing me affection? The distancer looks at this as nagging because he feels enmeshed and he backs off again. The pursuer, of course, feels abandoned and comes even closer. This dance can go on forever, but eventually, if the distancer keeps going away, the pursuer tends to feel so discouraged they will allow the abandonment depression to wash over them and will gradually give up and move away. This allows our distancer for the first time in a long time to feel relieved, to be able to catch his breath and feel like he's getting his other half back. For a few days after this relationship is broken up, the distancer will feel as if he's really a whole person again. When his friends ask him, how are you doing? I know that Nancy left you. He'll reply, I'm doing great. I really feel like I've got my life back. I'm all right. And that feeling continues for a while. It may be a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. But eventually, what the distancer often says is, you know, well, I'm doing great. You know how much of a nag Nancy was. But she used to be nice, too. And she cooked well. You know, and I think she was really pretty. You know, I think I still love her. So he comes back, and if Nancy hasn't found somebody else to be addicted to, and isn't totally fed up with a lack of commitment, they will merge gloriously all over again. Usually, though, Nancy has to pay him back, and the tables get switched for a while. And the relationship stabilizes momentarily, 
until the dance begins anew. They experience that incredible enmeshment and interweaving, joining between two people, but then it happens all over again. This is called a push-pull relationship. This is an addictive relationship. Most people do a lot of beating each other up in these relationships, but it's mostly emotional. Sometimes it can also become physical. One can usually predict what's going to happen during most of the dance, but it's hard to know when one person is totally finished with the other. It is quite difficult to ascertain when the distancer comes back if they have really learned anything at all. Occasionally, the distancer will have an epiphany, a sudden tremendous insight that something is wrong. They realize they are unable to commit. These people decide that they really love the other person, that they realize they have a problem, and they get help that they need. They are willing to go back into their childhood, grieve through the past pain, plug the holes that were there, and nurture themselves which is the only way it can be done. It is impossible to get an adult partner to nurture them sufficiently to fill those infantile holes. If a person did not receive it in childhood, only they can give it to themselves. It is more likely, however, that the person is only feeling abandonment fears of their own now. They desperately want the person back but it's about self-love and not an authentic realization of the worth of the other. And once they feel safe, these people will distance again. The real difficulty for therapists is that often these people come to therapy as a couple and they have very sure goals in mind. The distancer wants to prove that the pursuer is a nag and enmeshing, and they are. The pursuer wants to prove that the distancer can't commit, and they're right as well. What they want the therapist to do is to find the one person who's at fault, confront them, fix them, and then everything will be wonderful. Because the complaining individual doesn't have to change. The therapist's job is a tremendous sales task. They have to try to convince these people that the real problem is not about the other person. It's about their own lack of individuation. And if they just allow themselves to go back into their own past history and fix their one to five main core issues, they would tend to feel stronger and actually be ready for a healthy relationship. It is rare for people to do this. People who have grown up with a tremendous amount of enmeshment or abandonment have radar for other people who will be able to hit their buttons from the past. Subconsciously, due to their repetition compulsion, they look for a person who fits either how mom or dad acted or a combination of how mom and dad were. They certainly don't actively go out and search for it. In fact, Usually, they actively attempt to find something totally different. But invariably, they find exactly what they need in order to be able to recreate the pain again and hopefully get the right lesson learned this time around. In order to really solve this dilemma, they need to realize it's more about the poor parenting they received and not that they weren't good enough as a child. There really was something wrong with the way that mom and dad showed love and caring. They need to learn what individuation is and what really mature, healthy love is. Addictive relationships are not new. However, I believe certain historical trends have exasperated them in recent times. In the 1950s, the following model of relationships was common. When a couple married, the man usually worked out of the home. I believe that this situation caused many women to feel abandoned. The woman would have children and they'd get more involved with the family in general. 
The husband often would feel left out or simply chose not to be involved with the family, except in the limited role of being a breadwinner, because at that time, raising a family was looked at as a woman's job. The man would get more and more involved with work and the woman would feel increasingly abandoned. She would become overly involved with the children and would tend to get her neediness met by them. The husband would often have an affair either with his career or a co-worker. The mother would often symbolically marry the male child in an attempt to have her emotional needs met by the opposite sex child. What that would set up later on is a male child with a history of dealing with an enmeshed mother and a tendency to become relationship phobic. The female child would tend to have an abandoning father and would be set up for pursuing. I think that's exactly what happened in the 1950s and 60s and eventually led to the war between the sexes. As a society, it is important to move closer to the idea of people being whole and individual without excessive needing so that they can share and develop healthy relationships.